Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Ree. I am the former chancellor of the Washington, D.C. schools. I am also currently the CEO of an organization called Students First. And the whole idea behind Students First is a simple one, and it is that. If you look over the last 20 to 30 years in this country at the decisions that we have been making about education, they have largely been driven by special interest groups. So you have textbook manufacturers, you have teachers unions, you have testing companies. You have all of these organizations that have tremendous resources and therefore tremendous influence on how decisions get made. So that's the way the world works. That the fact that those organizations exist is not actually the problem. The problem that we face is that there is no organized national interest group with the same heft as, say, the teachers union that's advocating on behalf of children in education. So when children are left out of the equation and no one is defending what is good and right for them, and you have all these other special interests, what you end up with is a landscape that's very skewed towards the adults and very skewed away from children. So that's exactly what Students First aims to try to do, is balance that equation out and make sure that we have millions of members across the country that are advocating for what children deserve. So uh, I am often asked, because I was both the superintendent of a school district and now I run this organization, people always say, what's wrong with education in America today? Why are we doing so poorly? And oftentimes people say, you know, give us what the biggest issue in education is. And I always refuse to answer that question. I refuse to answer it because actually what is wrong with our system is pretty complicated. And when you try to distill it down to just one thing, then it sort of implies that if you solve that one thing, you're going to fix all of the problems, when in fact that is actually not true. But People don't like taking no for an answer, and so usually it's the press, the media, they're very persistent, and they goad me on. It's like, oh, come on, tell us what it is. It's the teacher's union, isn't it? Or the parents. Or we don't have enough money. Come on, tell us what it is, right? And you've actually probably heard a lot of this, too. You go to your cocktail parties. You and your friends sort of bemoan the state of public education in our country. And then inevitably, it sort of devolves down into what we need to do is invest more in our schools. The question is, is that really right? So I'm going to show you some, uh, some data. The first uh, slide, when Americans are asked how much money they think we are spending on public education in America today, what do they say? They say that we, we, they think we spend about $4,000 a year per kid. The reality is that we spend several times that, actually about $10,000 a year. So there is a huge disconnect. And that is not the only disconnect. Because when those same people are asked, they will very confidently tell you that they believe if we spent more money on education, we would get better results. So take a look at this. The red line shows the expenditure growth on education over the last few decades in this country. And the blue line shows our academic achievement levels of our children in both reading and math. And as you can see, we have grown several times what we're spending, and yet our children's academic progress has remained pretty stagnant. This creates an incredibly difficult dynamic in these tough economic times where people are start trying to figure out what to cut in, in the budgets, et cetera, because if, for example, in the last few decades, we had tripled the expenditures and the achievement levels had also tripled, then you would be able to say, OK, if you cut our budget by 10%, this is the, the loss that you're going to see. But we actually can't show that at all. In fact, in the last couple of years, there have been several states that have cut their education budgets and seeing their academic achievement levels rise. So we're in this really tough quandary right now about kind of you know, what the, the, the relationship is between expenditures and progress. So why, why is there this disconnect? What's the problem? Where is all of this money going? If we have grown the amount of money that we're spending so much and we haven't seen the results, what's happening? So I'm going to tell you a very quick story from when I was the chancellor in Washington, DC. Uh, in 2007, 
I took over the Washington, D.C. public schools. At the time, they were largely known as the most dysfunctional and lowest performing school district in the entire nation. Just to give you a, a, a sliver of data to, uh, to, to, to elucidate that for you, of all of the eighth graders who are attending school in D.C. in 2007, only 8% of them were on grade level in mathematics. 8% which means that 92% of our kids did not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. So it was no surprise that the young upstart mayor who had just been elected, his name was Adrian Fenty, decided that as his major priority, he was gonna take on fixing the schools. Because his theory was you cannot have a great city without a great public school system. So he decided to introduce legislation that would allow him to take over mayoral control of the schools. And he got the legislation passed, and in June of 2007, as his first act of having control of the schools, he nominated me as the city's first schools chancellor. Now, I was a 37-year-old Korean girl from Toledo, Ohio, who had never run a school, much less a school district. So people were looking at him and saying, this guy's crazy. Why, why would he think that she is a person who can fix the most dysfunctional school district in the country? And so for days, the, the, the thought that was teeming through everybody's mind was, what on God's green earth is Adrian Fenty thinking? And that was pretty much what I was thinking as I was sitting in my office the first few days uh, of my tenure thinking, where do you start when you're, you're, you're having to fix something where every single thing is broken, essentially? So I was lucky enough to have lots of people who wanted to come in and help. And a number of these people had actually seen what had been going on in the school district for several decades, and they had a lot of thoughts about what needed to change. But over and over again, in my, in my conversations with them, what they said to me was, you have to find out, Michelle, where all of the money is going. Because we were spending almost more money in Washington, D.C. per child than any other urban jurisdiction in the country, yet our results were absolutely abysmal. So when you went into the schools, you saw dilapidated school buildings, you saw teachers who had to buy supplies with their own money. It did not feel like one of the richest school districts in the nation. So it made sense to us that we would try to figure out where the money was being spent. So I sent my team out. I said, you know, go look at every spreadsheet, every Excel document you can. Tell me where we're spending the money. So a couple weeks later, my special assistant comes back to me and he says, okay, I did exactly what you said. I looked at all of the largest budget items and tried to figure out where they were going. He said, and I have found two very interesting things. Now, in education speak, interesting is code for whack. <laughs> so the first thing that he says is, number one, we are spending about $90 million a year transporting a few thousand special education kids through the system. So I do the quick back of the envelope math, because that sounds a little nuts, and it turns out that it's about $18,000 per year per kid on transportation. So I said, um, well, I don't know anything about running bus routes, but I'm pretty sure I can do it for less than $18,000 a year. For $18,000 a year, you could buy the kid a Saturn the first year <laughs> and a personal chauffeur for the Saturn every year after that. So I'm, I am confident that we can do it more effectively. And the good news is that we're going to be able to take the savings and push it down into the classroom where it's going to have more of an impact on kids. And he said, actually, not so fast. See, the problem is that the district had done such a poor job of transporting these special needs kids to their schools in the past that now we're under a court order, a consent decree. And there's this court-appointed special master, and he has the responsibility for transporting the kids to school every day. He's allowed to spend as much money as he wants, and all we can do at the end of the year is pay the bill. We have absolutely no ability to control costs. And I said, that is the craziest thing I have ever heard. And he said, that's because you haven't heard tidbit number two. <laughs> he said, I'm trying to figure out where are all these children going? Washington, D.C. is only a few square miles wide and long, 
You could be doing laps around the city all day, and you still shouldn't be able to burn off $18,000 worth of fuel. So where is all the money going? He says, and the thing that, that it turns out that we were not just doing a bad job of transporting these special education kids. We were doing a very bad job of educating them as well. And the, the sort of culture became uh, that the parents would sue the school district because their kids weren't getting the services and resources that they needed. We would inevitably lose that lawsuit because we were, in fact, doing a pretty sucky job. And then the court would prescribe a remedy. And most often that remedy was that they would send them to a private school and we would be required to pay the tuition to that private school. And it was not just that, but every kid had a different remedy. So you had a situation where you might have a housing complex that had 10 special needs kids living in it. And each of these 10 kids would all be assigned to a different school in these far-flung places, in Virginia and in Maryland. So you'd have 10 different buses roll up in the morning with 10 different bus drivers and 10 different bus matrons who are making sure that the kids are okay on the bus, all going in different directions to these far-flung places. That was one of the reasons that we were spending all of this money and not seeing any results. Now, this is actually not just unique to Washington, D.C. If you look at this next slide, you will see that since the 1970s, we have had more than 26 states have court-mandated sort of education finance cases that have resulted in really, really dramatic increases to funding, education funding. And the whole goal of that was to try to equalize things and make uh, the education achievement levels of minority kids more equal to where it was for other children. Have we succeeded at that? No, is the quick answer. If you look at the minority achievement level in these 26 states, it really hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, a, a review of three states in particular shows that the achievement levels of the minority kids in these three states where they had these increases actually didn't even keep up with the national averages. This is not just uh, about the courts. It is about lots of different special interest groups. You have the state governments, you have the federal government, you have school boards. Everybody wants to put in set-asides. Right? So they say, we want some of this money to go to curriculum development, and we want some of the money to go to this community program, we want some of the money to go to textbook adoptions, and they mandate these set-asides. And what it results in is that of the $10,000 that we're spending per child, actually only about half of it is going into the classroom where we think it's going to have the most impact. The rest of it is going to these other things. So this slide actually jives more with people's perceptions of how much money is being spent, because that's what they see in the classroom, right? So let's get to what needs to happen about it. It's actually pretty simple. We need to stop spending money on things that do not work and start putting our money towards the things that do. More specifically, what that means in a school district is that we should set really specific goals for what we expect a classroom or a school to achieve. We have to give people the freedom and the autonomy to make the decisions about where those dollars are going to be best, be best spent to get to that goal. Then we have to measure whether or not they met the goal or not. And then we have to have some accountability. So if you did meet the goal or exceeded the goal, then we're going to look at what you did and we're going to share those best practices with others. And if you did not meet the goal, then we're not going to let you spend the money in the same way. But that is not the way that we run things. So in order to change the system, it's not just going to require a change with the courts and, and the federal government. It actually also requires a cultural change. And let me tell you why. As a parent, and I have two kids, I had this perception of what school should look like for my two daughters, right? So when, she, when my daughter went to kindergarten, I thought, I want a grandmotherly woman who has had a long teaching career, who will take my daughter on her lap and read her a book. And if she's only in the classroom with 15 or 16 other kids, that's going to be better for my child. What I don't want is for her to be sitting in front of you know, computers, in front of a computer screen, because that seems cold and rigid and that sort of thing, right? So this is what we believe. We hold as our, 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 our sort of beliefs. But the reality, actually, is that the research shows that class size largely doesn't matter. 
If you have a smaller class size versus a larger class size, it doesn't have that much impact on a student's achievement levels. And the, the, the latest data that's coming out from some of these new programs that utilize technology pretty heavy in the classroom shows very good results for kids because you can differentiate for the individual needs of every child. So at the end of the day, what we have to do is ensure that we are not continuing to spend more money and not fix the system and, and expect that we're gonna get a different result. What we need to do is something very, very different. We have to reinvigorate the system by investing in what works and by innovating. So the bottom line is that the next time you go to a cocktail party where you hear your friend Ted say that you've got, we've got to spend more money on education to fix it, you should say, do we, Ted? Do we? <laughs> because really what we ought to be doing is, you know, is, is ensuring that we are uh, not over mandating and over prescribing where the dollar should be spent, that we're innovating around new strategies that can help kids learn, and then at the end of the day, we should funnel our resources to where we know it's working for kids. That is uh, assuredly gonna make you the hit of the party. Thank you. <laughs>